He left this world on the 16th of August, 1977. More than 80,000 people crowded into Memphis to attend his funeral. They wept as the white limousines and hearse traveled to Forest Hill Cemetery. A few weeks later, he was moved here to his final resting place, where he now lies between his mother, Gladys, and his father, Vernon, and alongside his grandmother, Minnie May. A marker in memory of his infant twin, Jesse Guerin, was also placed here in the meditation garden. Every year since then, on the eve of the anniversary of his death, a candlelight service is held to honor his memory. Over the years, thousands upon thousands of people from all walks of life, from all 50 states, and almost every foreign country have stood at these gates for hours and days at a time, hoping to catch a glimpse of the man who lived within these walls. They felt a strong kinship with him, a sense of pride in his accomplishments, and a delight that he was able to enjoy the fruits of his labor to such an extent. They also took pleasure in the fact that he represented the American dream and that it was still very real and possible to attain. He gave them that, and he gave them a great deal more. Don't be cruel, teddy bear Dancing hips and long black hair Old friend, you crossed my mind today Las Vegas Hotel, Graceland Sweet young daughter and a million fans Old friend, you touched my heart today If I listen to you close in the still of the night I can hear your voice saying you're alright Close my eyes, open my soul Touch the king of rock and roll, old friend It's good to feel you once again You shook us all up, you loved us tender Caught us in a trap, we all surrendered on Loving you Don't Baby, dream me not I'm falling in love with you I can sit down, put your records on Seven sad days are suddenly gone God, you were young It doesn't seem fair Would you be here? If I could have been there, oh friend My heart's crying once again Trapped here on earth, your mother's free The lonely pain we refuse to see Old friend, you touched my heart today Oh, old friend, I'm missing you once Hello, I'm Priscilla Bollier Presley, and I'm very aware of what Graceland has come to mean to so many people throughout the world. It's a tangible link to the man that they loved and admired through the years. And as an executor of his estate, it was my feeling that Graceland should be open to the public so they could share in his accomplishments and have a clearer understanding of not only the legend, but of the man himself. As you travel this road leading to the main house, there is very little to indicate that this was the home of a poor country boy from Tupelo, Mississippi, who, with remarkable instincts and a God-given ability, was able to define a whole new era of American music. 
This is Graceland. Since 1957, the home of Elvis Aaron Presley. Although it has become a symbol, a museum, and to some people, a shrine, it is still first and foremost the place where Elvis lived, laughed, and shared good times with his friends and family. In other words, it was a home, in the best and truest sense of the word. I'm happy you can join us now as we make our own private tour of Graceland. And I'm pleased to be able to act as your host for this hour and contribute some insights into the life and career of this living legend named Elvis Presley. We're in the main hallway. The first thing that you see when you enter the front door, this and everything else in the house, has been restored to its original condition wherever possible. This is the decor and the furnishings that were used 18 of the 20 years that he lived here. Elvis bought Graceland in 1957, just a few short years after his career began to skyrocket on a national basis. Now, can you imagine the sense of gratification he felt? This young man in his early 20s, who'd been laughed at and scorned for his musical tastes and ambitions, to be able to sit down and write a check for $100,000 cash and purchase a southern mansion. It wasn't only the fact that he now owned a large house and nearly 14 acres of land that pleased Elvis so much. It was also nice to know he had purchased a piece of history, a property that had been in the previous owner's family for generations. You might say it gave him instant respectability. Elvis bought Graceland from a woman named Mrs. Moore. The estate was named after Mrs. Moore's great aunt, Grace. And during the 20 years that Elvis called this home, he made many improvements, some of which you'll see as we travel through the house and grounds. In order to really comprehend what this house meant to Elvis and to me when I lived here, I think it's important to put it all into some kind of perspective. Elvis was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, in a 30 by 15 foot shack. Elvis's mother, Gladys, had the normal aspirations for her son, that he should grow up healthy and eventually have a steady, well-paying job with the possibility of a pension at the end of the road. It was a good, solid middle-class dream, and never went so far afield as to include the possibility of his ever becoming an entertainer, let alone the most legendary star in the history of entertainment. I read comic books and I was the hero of the comic book. I saw movies and I was the hero in the movie. So every dream that I ever dreamed has come true a hundred times. In the early years, Elvis didn't harbor any great ambitions for himself. He thought perhaps of becoming a mechanic as he liked to work with his hands, one of the first jobs he ever held was driving a truck for the Crown Electric Company. It was in that truck that he first drove to Sun Records in Memphis to record two songs to give his mother for her birthday, My Happiness and That's When Your Heartaches Begin, both originally recorded by the Ink Spots. When I was working for Sam Phillips, one of the services we offered was a general recording service which gave the public an opportunity to literally come in off the street and make a record of anything they wanted to. Three dollars one side, four dollars two. One day a very strange looking young man with sideburns came in and said he wanted to make a record for his mother. I believe he said for his mother's birthday. Sam wasn't there at the time, so I decided to cut the record for him myself. Partway through the first side, I began to get these very strange reactions to his voice and his manner of singing, and I did something that normally we never did. I reached out and started the tape recorder so that I could get a part of one of the songs so that Sam could hear it later when he came back. Hey, you had to be blind not to know the guy had something. Something nobody could describe. I don't think till this day that we can describe what Presley had. But he had it. He had it in abundance. But the dream must have taken shape for Elvis long before that first recording. Perhaps it started when he won second prize at the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Talent Contest at the age of 10. He sang Old Shep and he charmed the judges. In any event, it was a far cry from the simple surroundings he was used to as a child to this elegant dining room with its fine china and crystal chandelier. The setting was obviously different. But what about Elvis himself? Well, oddly enough, he really hadn't changed that much. He still enjoyed the companionship of his family and friends at dinner time. And it wasn't uncommon for 10 to 12 of them to be around this table when dinner was served. And that was usually around 9 or 10 in the evening. 
My clearest memories are of this room around Christmas time. There was always a very large tree set up in front of the window over there, and everybody would help decorate it. Why well, take that back? Almost everybody. Elvis would usually prefer to supervise rather than actually participate. And when it got close to midnight on Christmas Eve, we'd all gather around the tree and we'd exchange our gifts. Elvis was always home for Christmas. The decorations would start going up around Thanksgiving and then remain up through his birthday on January the 8th. One time, when Elvis was in California, he noticed the extravagant way that some people decorated their property for the holidays. He was particularly impressed with one estate where the driveway was illuminated from street to front door with an elaborate display of blue lights. He called his father, Vernon, in Memphis. He described the look, and he told him to arrange the same setup for Graceland in time for his return. Well, Vernon said the way that he described it, it could easily be mistaken for the lights on an airport runway, and they'd be darn lucky if a plane didn't land right in the front lawn. Nevertheless, he followed Elvis's instructions, and when he arrived back at Graceland for Christmas, Elvis was delighted with the effect. Of course, the inside looked very festive as well, and even the draperies in the formal rooms were changed to bright red for the holiday season. You know, Elvis had remarkable hearing, and once before Christmas, he overheard the guys speculating about the size of their customary Christmas bonuses. As a joke on Christmas Eve, he presented them each with envelopes containing $5 gift certificates to McDonald's. <laughs> I uh, opened my little envelope and I couldn't believe what I was seeing because this is the first time this had ever happened with Elvis. And I sort of did a double take and I uh, looked at him and he looked at me and I kind of froze and I waited for his reaction. He just broke out laughing and slapped me on the shoulder and I hugged him. We just sort of rolled around for a few seconds. Uh, Elvis had, he just had a tremendous sense of humor. I wish people could have seen that side of him. It was a Merry Christmas after all. People who knew Elvis as a child are quick to point out that his generous nature was not as a result of his newfound wealth and success. They can all remember stories of him when he was young and had very few toys, sharing whatever he did have with the other children who had even less than he. Giving just seemed to be a, a natural part of his nature. Christmas time only comes once a year. But it's one of the toughest times for all the guys around Elvis. This is the time of year we have to buy Elvis a Christmas present. And he is so hard to buy for, because anytime he wants something, he just go out and buy it. So every time we could think of something, he already had it. So it was really tough for us at Christmas time. The gifts that gave him the most pleasure were not necessarily expensive items, but were things that required thought and work on the part of the giver. Homemade items or, or little poems were especially meaningful to him, and he kept them for years and years. In 1971, I was visiting with Elvis and his family. As I started to leave, Elvis escorted me to the foyer. As we were standing there talking, Lisa came through pushing her baby buggy. I turned to Elvis and remarked, Elvis, she will soon be four years old. What do you plan to give her for her fourth birthday? With a wide sweep of his hands, he said, you know, all of this is but for a day. And we talked about home and roots and his childhood and about leaving Tupelo with the small trunk and all their worldly belongings. And he said, Ms. McComb, I would like for her to remember and be remembered the lady for which she will be and not for what she's acquired. I said, in other words, we talked of um, the values of life and he said, could you write for me a poem to give her that would make her know these values? And I said, Elvis, in other words, you want me to write a priceless gift? And he said, yes. I wrote the poem and when I brought it to him, he grabbed it with both arms and after he read it, he bounded up the stairs. He came back down and he was crying. And he took my copy and he wrote on it, this is just beautiful, Elvis Presley. And he looked and the tears had smeared my copy. And with his elbow, he started to wipe them away, remarking, Ms. McComb, I've ruined your copy. And I said, no, Elvis, someday those teardrops will be priceless. New Year's was another big holiday celebration at Graceland. Elvis used to buy over $2,000 worth of fireworks to set off at midnight. We used to have uh, fireworks battles at Graceland around the holidays. Elvis would buy a tremendous amount of fireworks and we would divide up in two teams. We'd put on leather jackets and helmets and goggles and we'd take these Roman candles and fire them at each other. 
and each team had their supply of fireworks, their ammunition, if you will, right behind the team area. And something happened one night, and a Roman candle went astray and went right into our supply of fireworks. And you'd have thought uh, an atom bomb or something had gone off. It just exploded, and, and the sight was just breathtaking. It was beautiful, all these fireworks going up. And I said, Elvis, isn't that great looking? And he said, it ought to be, GK. It cost me 2,000 bucks. This is the living room, and this is the famous 15-foot couch that was especially custom-made just for this room. Many items here hold memories for me and Elvis. That picture of Elvis's father, Vernon, was given to Elvis by him for Christmas in 1976. And this portrait of Elvis, which used to hang in Vernon's office behind his desk, was made when Elvis was about 22 years old, just about the time he bought Graceland. In addition to these paintings, there are many others throughout the house. Most of them were placed here when Graceland was open to the public. When he lived here, Elvis didn't care to see his face staring at him from all the walls. But there was one portrait he was especially fond of. I was painting in my studio one afternoon at Caesar's Palace, and I was looking over my shoulder, and I thought I saw Elvis Presley. And I did a quick double take, I looked, and it really was Elvis. And uh, he told me that he had seen a portrait that I had recently done of Johnny Mathis, and he wanted one. And of course, I was super delighted. We set up an appointment for a couple of days later. And as the day arrived and Elvis came walking through the casino, I said, Elvis, that's all I needed. I just needed to see you just walking across the casino. And he said, oh, wow, I just gave the band the whole day off. And uh, about a week later, I was horseback riding, and I got this call from the security guys at the studio, and uh, they said, Elvis is here, and he wants the portrait. And uh, there was a little problem with not having the amount of cash or something, and I said, oh, come on, we've got to let him have the painting, but it's not quite finished. And he said, Elvis said it's exactly the way he wants his painting to look. The portrait was of a secure, confident superstar at the height of his powers. It was a different Elvis Presley that occupied this house back in 1957. Then, he was just on the brink of a career that was to become the talk of the entertainment world. That's All Right Mama was a hit in Memphis, Tennessee overnight. Um, when I got on the road to try to convince the people that we hopefully had something a little different, um, it was a little different story. Headed for Shreveport, Louisiana. Didn't get too favorable results from the stations and the people that I knew at uh, the stations in Shreveport. The same was true in uh, Houston, Texas and left Houston, Texas one Sunday night in a dust storm, got to Dallas, Texas Monday morning, and the counter girl there, Alta Hayes, uh, for Big State Distributing Company, met me, and I looked apparently down, and she said, what in the hell's wrong, Sam? And I said, well, I don't, I'm not convinced that I've convinced anybody that we may have a record that could sell some records. And uh, she said, well, I got news for you. I've got the record, I got the sample, and you can believe me, uh, you have got a record that's going to sell. And I think it's going to be a hit. And I'm going to see that every jukebox operator gets a copy if I have to sneak them in the, file, in the pile of records that they buy. Back in 1954, I was producing a Saturday night show in Shreveport, Louisiana called The Louisiana Hayride. On the cast, young Elvis Presley, along with him, Scotty Moore and Bill Black. He was getting Elvis was $18 a week for Saturday night. By 1955, I had raised him to $200, and he added a third man, DJ Fontana, his drummer. It had become obvious to me that we had to have a booking agency, a promotion organization, in order to book our acts all over the United States. Now, I knew just such a man, Tom Parker from Nashville, Tennessee. I arranged to pay his expenses, brought him to Shreveport. He stayed there some three weeks, announced at the end of that time that he was not going to book for us, he was going to manage Elvis Presley. Part of Colonel's plan was to get Elvis signed to a major record company like RCA. But he knew of Elvis's loyalty to Sam Phillips, the owner of Sun Records. At that time, I'd had five releases on Sun Records by Elvis, and the rumors were spreading that the contract of Elvis was for sale from Sun Records. I wanted to find out the source of it. I had suspected that it was Tom Parker that was spreading those rumors. I called Tom Parker at the Warwick Hotel in New York. I said, Tom, are you spreading the rumors that Elvis Presley's contract is for sale? He denied the fact that he uh, had said anything about it or knew anything about it. 
In the course of that conversation, he said, is this contract for sale? I said, well, maybe anything is for sale, Tom, but I want to put a stop to these rumors. Or if you want to buy his contract, there's a possibility, but we've got to get together and work something out. I thought about what is a fair price. I called Irvin Green at Mercury Records, a friend of mine, found out for sure that he had sold to Mitch Miller uh, a contract on Frankie Lane for $25,000. So I set a price of $35,000 thinking that the man is not going to pay $35,000, so I'll keep Elvis and uh, we'll go on our merry way and the rumors will stop. And uh, I've been asked a million times, was I sorry that I sold Elvis Presley's contract? Hey, you may think I'm an idiot, and I may be an idiot, but I'm not sorry I sold Elvis Presley's contract because I had a lot of other things in view. I had recorded, uh, it wasn't out yet, but I had recorded Blue Suede Shoes by Carl Perkins. I had audition tapes on Johnny Cash. Uh, I had heard about Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, I had a guy working for me at that time by the name of Bill Justice was raunchy, the biggest instrumental as it turned out later on. So I needed the money. Parker got down here. And uh, he got the 35000 I took his $35,000. I have not regretted for one day that I sold Elvis Presley's contract. The first record he made for RCA was Heartbreak Hotel. It was on the Billboard charts for eight weeks as the number one record in the country and was Elvis's first gold record. After that, everybody wanted him for personal appearances. On your, on your personal appearances, you create a sort of mass hysteria. Uh, amongst your audiences of teenagers. Is your shaking and quaking in the nature of an involuntary response uh, to this hysteria? Uh, would you say that again, sir? Well, I say that when, when you shake and you quake when you sing, is that the sort of an involuntary response to the hysteria of your audience? In involuntary? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm aware of everything I do at all times, but uh, it's just the way I feel. Hollywood and the movies were beckoning for a piece of this six-foot, strikingly handsome, sensuous young performer. And television producers also woke up to the fact that there was a new phenomenon in their midst. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Ladies and gentlemen, uh... This is the music room, dominated by this nine-foot concert grand piano, finished in gold leaf. And the stories about this piano are as fascinating as the piano itself. Elvis called me into the kitchen one day and told me that he knew I needed a piano for the church that I was pastoring. And he said he would like for me to have the gold one because he no longer needed it. I was really overwhelmed by his generosity, but not surprised. The piano was really too large for the church. And I asked him if I could trade it for a smaller one. And he said whatever suited our needs was fine with him because he gave it to me. My husband pulled the tractor up in front of the house moved the piano out on the dipper of the tractor. That was the last I saw of it until it was moved back into Graceland one evening. In the spring of 1982, we were preparing to open Graceland to the public. Uh, newspaper articles uh, had caused telephone calls to begin pouring in from people all over the country who had artifacts that Elvis had owned or things that had been at Graceland. Most of them wanted us to purchase those things. We even had a call from a, a, a woman who wanted to know if we were interested in buying x-rays of Elvis's teeth. So amongst all those calls one day, a gentleman here in Memphis called and told us that he had the gold piano that had been at Graceland. Uh, I was amazed and uh, told him that we had no way of purchasing the piano from him because we knew it was quite valuable. He surprised us by saying that he would be willing to put it on permanent loan at Graceland and he brought it out to Graceland and it sits today in the music room. Elvis used to love to sit at the piano and pick out tunes, especially gospel and sacred music. He also loved to be surrounded by people who sang with a feeling and a sense of spontaneity. And although Elvis has been called the king of rock and roll and has made tremendous contributions to pop and country music, it's interesting to note that the only Grammy Awards he ever won were for his albums of sacred music. Now we're going to go to the TV room, which is located in the basement. When Elvis first bought Graceland, these were just bare rooms. He decided he wanted an informal place to watch television, listen to records, and bring people over to party. In this room, he could do all three. He loved television, especially live sports events and sitcoms. 
Some of his favorites were I Love Lucy, Carol Burnett, and The Dick Van Dyke Show. There are at least 14 sets in the different rooms here at Graceland. The idea of the three TV sets in a row he caught from Lyndon Johnson. When Johnson was president, he liked to watch all three network news programs at the same time. All of us like to do the same thing with football games. He kept most of his record collection down here. As you go through these stacks of records, it's apparent that he had a wide range of taste in music. There are all kinds here. From gospel, rhythm and blues, country, pop, bluegrass, classical, and even opera. The rest of the collection was located in the private bedrooms upstairs, along with cassettes of his favorite films, his books, and an organ. Because of the personal nature of the upstairs rooms, it was decided with the opening of Graceland as a museum to keep those rooms sealed from the general public. And we continue to honor that wish for this tour as well. This jukebox holds a hundred records, and it was wired so you could hear it in all the rooms of the house. Elvis could show movies down here, and this bar soda fountain was the focal point to lots of parties. In the early 70s, Elvis and I were flying back from Los Angeles to Memphis, and he started talking about his desire to have some sort of logo or symbol to represent his philosophy of life and business. We took out a pad and started sketching a design. By the time we landed, we had it completed. It was the three letters TCB, which stood for Taking Care of Business, and a lightning bolt, which stood for In a Flash. It was first made into a necklace, and then Elvis had some made up with the letters TLC for the ladies, meaning Tender Loving Care. But the TCB with a lightning bolt became his signature, and he placed it on many items, from this ring, the tail end of the Lisa Marie. Elvis's private plane had many wonderful stories connected to it. Elvis called me up to the house one day and he said, Joe, he says, I need to get an airplane. He said, I don't want a small plane, I want a big one, a big four-engine jet. So not knowing anything about airplanes, I called this broker in Los Angeles and he said, the best place to go for those kind of planes would be down in Tucson, Arizona. They're all stored down there. So I catch a plane, fly down there, and meet a salesman down there, and he shows me all these airplanes. And I see this 888 Convair. It was a gorgeous airplane. So I called Elvis up, and I said, Elvis, I found a nice plane. I think you should come down and see it. He said, Joe, he said, I don't want to see it. He says, I'll take your word for it. If you like it, go ahead and buy it. So he bought the Lisa Marie for $250,000. He then spent another $600,000 having it customized. And when it was completed, he hired a crew of four to be on permanent call November of 1975. In the early days of his career, Elvis had a fear of flying, so he preferred to drive to his engagements, and later he got his own bus. But once he got the Lisa Marie and he felt comfortable with the crew, he took great pride and pleasure in the aircraft. Sometimes, on the spur of the moment, he would gather up a group of people and just fly over Memphis, showing them the city from the air. And I remember once on our daughter's birthday, he flew the plane to Los Angeles and then took her to Las Vegas to celebrate. Although the aircraft served an important function enabling him to fly over 3,000 miles at a time without refueling, it was also an expensive toy to him. And he enjoyed that aspect of it, probably more than the practical side. I guess the best story to illustrate that concerns the now famous Memphis to Denver food run. One night uh, late, about one o'clock in the morning when I got a call from uh, the mansion, asking me if we could get the uh, aircraft ready to leave for Denver within an hour. And of course, I got the crew ready, filed a flight plan, and uh, in about an hour and a half, the uh, people came out to the aircraft with Elvis, and we were on our way to Denver. And en route, I asked one of the people there what we were going out there for, and uh, he said, we're going out there for peanut butter sandwiches. And I said, oh, yes, we're going out for peanut butter sandwiches. And uh, when we arrived in Denver, the limousine pulled up next to the aircraft. A man got out with big silver trays. And sure enough, there were peanut butter sandwiches. And uh, Elvis insisted that the crew have some of his famous peanut butter sandwiches, and uh, I'm not much one for peanut butter sandwiches, but of course, I had to say it was the best peanut butter sandwich I ever had. In February of 1984, the Lisa Marie came back home to Memphis for the final time. 
Instruments had to be found from across the country to make it airworthy enough to fly it from Fort Lauderdale to Memphis. The FAA had to grant a special ferry permit. And once it arrived in Memphis, the tail section and 30 feet from each wing had to be temporarily removed to get it through the streets of the city. A parade in marching bands led the aircraft back to its rightful home, where it now stands, freshly painted and right across the street from Graceland. Though it might not have seemed like taking care of business in a flash, the business was taken care of. And now millions of fans can view the Lisa Marie when they come to visit Graceland. You should have been here a few minutes ago. I just made six balls in one shot. <laughs> well, as you can see, we're down in the pool room. Some people love it, some people hate it. Elvis loved it. Oh, by the way, I didn't make the tear in that felt over there. That was one of Elvis's friends trying to make a trick shot. Obviously, he missed. Elvis bought this table in 1957, just shortly after he bought Graceland. He loved the game, and like everything else he put his mind to, he was good at it. The room is decorated with 750 yards of fabric. Shooting pool was only one of the ways that Elvis let off steam. He also had other means of relaxing and diverting attention away from work. Sometimes, he would rent the local movie theater to show films to family and friends. Patton was one of his favorites. Also, the Monty Python films and anything with Peter Sellers. The films he liked, he would show over and over again often reciting all the dialogue with the actors. Elvis loved movies, but he couldn't go to the movie theater just like any ordinary person. He'd cause a mob scene. So we started running the movie theater in the evenings. And we'd go to a film exchange, get three or four first-run movies. He would never let us get one of his movies because he hated to see himself on screen. And we'd sit there and watch these movies, but Elvis, if he didn't like a movie, the good thing about him having control, he could just turn it off and start another one. Other times, he would rent out the skating rink or the local amusement park called Liberty Land. Once he rode the Pippin roller coaster for two and a half hours straight, and he was so crazy about the bumper car ride that he seriously talked about bringing the whole ride to Graceland. And when things got too calm, the gang, led by Elvis, would take to their wheels and kick up a little dust. Sure, we kicked up our heels a lot. We had some wild and crazy times, like running the amusement park all night long and like uh, converting snowmobiles to riding them on the land all over Graceland. But I think what it was, we, when we were poor, when we were young, we, we couldn't afford those things. And now that Elvis was uh, a superstar and extremely wealthy, uh, he, he could let us sort of relive our, our youth and, and do things that we couldn't do when we were kids. All these activities were played with the high spirits of youth. Elvis loved to instigate, participate, and best of all, win. We're in the den or jungle room, so nicknamed because of its decor. The room itself was added onto the house in 1965, and Elvis selected the furniture from Donald's Furniture Store in about a half an hour. Elvis said it reminded him of Hawaii, a place he was attached to. He bought the furniture partly because he liked it, and partly because his father had made fun of it when he saw it in the store. Elvis enjoyed having breakfast in this room that boasted plastic greenery and a large artificial waterfall. He enjoyed watching television here on a large screen that used to stand right in front of the waterfall. He also felt it was a good place to record, probably because of the carpets that are on the ceiling, an idea he got from California. He made two albums in this room, from Elvis Presley Boulevard, Memphis, Tennessee, and his last album, Woody Blue. The recording sessions usually took place at night, and sometimes lasting till morning. RCA would park the recording trucks in the backyard, run wires into the den, and set up the musicians over here. And Elvis would usually change the color of the light bulbs to match the mood of the song he was recording. Though it was fun, Elvis was always aware of the quality of his work and maintained a high level of professionalism when delivering the final product. Elvis always had his family around him at Graceland. His mother and father, of course, and his grandmother, and lots of cousins, and his aunt Delta. She still lives here. She supervises the housekeeping staff and often greets some of the half a million visitors who come to the house on the tour each year. My husband had a heart attack and I called Elvis. He sent two of his guys after me and all my stuff. And I've been living here ever since, since 1967. And uh, that's Edmund, that was Elvis's dog, but he kindly adopted me, so after Elvis died, I've 
took um, taken care of him. And Elvis was a very special person. He never turned no one down that was in need. He was a loving and caring person for everyone that he came in contact with, and most everyone loved him. One of the reasons that Elvis loved Graceland was because it could fulfill his dream of being surrounded by all kinds of animals. Over the course of 20 years, there was a regular zoo here, including a turkey named Bowtie. There were peacocks, minor birds, parrots, mules, guinea hens, ducks, monkeys, and of course, the famous chimpanzee, Scatter. <laughs> Scatter had a definite mind of his own, and he also loved to chase the ladies. Elvis was so fond of him that he built him a house out back, complete with heat in the winter and air conditioning for those hot summer days. Everybody knows how attached Elvis would get to his pets. And if one of them happened to pass away while Elvis was on the road, they would try to keep the news from him for as long as they could. And often when Elvis went out for a ride, he would return with some furry, fuzzy, or feathery thing in the car with him. It was the most natural thing in the world for him to be around animals, and most of them responded in kind. To a teenager growing up in the 50s and 60s, nothing symbolized freedom more than a set of wheels. The love affair with cars starts even younger, and never quite ends. Elvis was of that generation, and when he was able to afford anything he desired, cars were one of the first things he indulged in. He owned many of the finest automobiles ever made, and he was also famous for giving them away for the slimmest of reasons. Although Elvis owned hundreds of cars, many of them one of a kind, these were his favorites for one reason or another. This 1973 Stutz was a remarkable machine with real gold trim and a gold key for the ignition being only two of its unique and elegant features. The Ferrari was built for speed and styling, was sleek and understated, all the qualities that Elvis admired. The three supercycles had Volkswagen engines, and Elvis used to love riding them up and down Elvis Presley Boulevard up front. The pink Jeep was used by Elvis in the movie Blue Hawaii, and many guests who come to visit Grayson love to have their pictures taken in that Jeep. And of course, one of the most famous cars associated with Elvis is the pink Cadillac he gave to his mother. Although it was true, she never drove it, and as a matter of fact, never even had a driver's license. The car was a very important symbol to Elvis. It showed how much he cared for his mother, how he was able to give her the best things in life, and that he wanted to repay in his way all the love and care that she had showered on him from the beginning. Though Elvis was extremely generous, he also enjoyed making a good deal. And once when he ordered a fleet of cars from a local dealer, he found that he wasn't given a discount of any kind and canceled the order and he took his business elsewhere. This building, which is not on the regular tour and has never been open to the public, was used by a full-time staff of people hired to respond to the tremendous amount of fan mail that Elvis received from all over the world. Many of the items that were received, such as his photo album, Scrapbooks, portraits, teddy bears, fan mail, scarves, t-shirts, were all sent here to be acknowledged and stored for Elvis. Most were given by him to children's hospitals and orphanages. Perhaps more than any other entertainer, Elvis felt a powerful bond with his fans throughout the world. He knew they were responsible for his continuing success, that they were loyal and supportive throughout his entire career and that they took great pleasure in his triumphs and stature in the world. They would overwhelm him with letters and gifts and signs of their devotion, and whenever possible, he would come to the gates of Graceland and talk to the ones who would gather there. The fans, as a rule, would respect his right to privacy, but since they felt such a kinship with him, some of them would treat his home and his life as if it were their own. Once when Elvis heard a splashing noise coming from the pool area, and when he went out to investigate, he found a girl swimming around in his pool. Rather than becoming angry at this invasion of his privacy, he just warned the fan to be careful, and he left her there to continue her swim. One of the things that Elvis and I shared in common was a love of horses. He took great pride in this area of Graceland and was in complete charge of organizing a barn and stable. All instructions for care and feeding of the horses and the maintenance of the tack and other riding equipment came directly from him. 
When Elvis purchased a farm in Mississippi, he felt every one of the gang should have his own horse. So he went out and got 17 of them. Of course, a horse is no good without a saddle. So he got 17 of those. Now, if you have a horse and you have a saddle, you have to have some way of getting to the horse and some way of carrying the saddle. So he also bought everyone his own pickup truck. Elvis never did anything halfway. Of all the horses that Elvis owned during his years at Graceland, five are still here under the expert care of Aileen Rayford. And this was his favorite. It's a golden Palomino quarter horse named Rising Sun. And in this coming May, he'll be 24 years old. Elvis used to ride him down to the front wall where there were lots of fans gathered. He'd occasionally sign autographs. He bought Rising Sun in 1967. And for a time, this barn was known as the House of Rising Sun. This is Mayor Ingram. The horse was named after William Ingram, who was the mayor of Memphis at the time. And now I'd like you to meet Ebony's double. Sired by the world champion walking horse, Ebony's Masterpiece. Last year, after eight years of being out to pasture, Ebony was retrained over a period of 40 days and performed an exhibition at the Tennessee Walking Horse Celebration in Shelbyville. Ebony's double went through his paces to a medley of Elvis's songs, and needless to say, the response from the crowd was overwhelming. Yeah. This beautiful horse is Memphis. His claim to fame? Of the original 17 horses that Elvis bought, he's the last to survive. Hey. Hey. Hey there. <laughs> a little busy. <laughs> and this is Lisa Marie's pony, Mariah. Yeah. <laughs> Elvis used to love to get a rise out of people and would often do offbeat things just to get their reaction. When Grandma Presley was alive, he once brought this pony right into the den. The pony, not making any distinction between outdoors and indoors, did what came naturally. <laughs> Much to the annoyance of Grandma, who informed Elvis in no uncertain terms what she thought of his actions. Elvis loved sports. In the mid-70s, racquetball was catching on all over the country. So he decided to build his own court. And this was the result. It wasn't only used for racquetball, but for weightlifting and jogging as well. Up on the third level, there's a whirlpool and steam room. And on this floor, a lounge and a bar. This is the last piano Elvis ever played. It was on the morning of August 16th and he had played a few games of racquetball and stopped on his way out to relax at the piano. He played Unchained Melody, and Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, and then headed back to the house. The racquetball court itself was constructed in 1975 and provided Elvis with countless hours of pleasure and wholesome head-to-head -head competition. He was even toying with the idea of opening a chain of franchise racquetball courts all across the country but never had the chance to put his plan into action. Though the outside of the building has remained basically the same, the room where the racquetball court was located has been converted into a theater, where his millions of fans can come and see a short film of his phenomenal career. We're fortunate to have this legacy for generations to share, who never saw Elvis in person, and for those who want to rekindle the fond memories that they still hold. All the talk in the world will not come close to giving you the feeling of just how great an entertainer Elvis was. And it's equally true that there is no possible way to measure his position in the world of music without turning to this building right here. It was originally a large patio that housed one of Elvis's hobbies, a slot car racing track. Elvis and I were married in Las Vegas, but we had a second reception here in 1967 and then it was enclosed and used as a trophy room and a storage area. This building is divided into three sections. The first gives some indication of Elvis's life and career, beginning with his birth certificate, family pictures, and memories of life back in Tupelo, Mississippi, his birthplace. Memories of his army career are located in this building too. The uniform he wore in 1958.
stacks of petitions from fans trying to persuade the government not to draft Elvis. and his honorable discharge from the service which he received in March of 1960 after serving for a year and a half in Germany. Elvis could very easily have been assigned to the Special Services branch of the Army. He could have spent his military time entertaining the troops as lesser known performers have done. But he chose instead to be treated like every other inductee. And for that, he gained the admiration of the other soldiers with whom he served. It was while Elvis was stationed in Germany that we first met. After his discharge, he returned here to Graceland to resume his career and to once again enjoy his freedom and pleasures of civilian life. Well, Elvis, now you're really home. How does it feel? It's pretty hard to describe, I'll tell you. It, it, it's hard to get used to, you know. I mean, I've been looking forward to it for two years, and all of a sudden, here it is. It's uh, not easy to adjust to. Are you going to keep Graceland? I'm going to keep bracing as long as I possibly can. <laughs> it would take more than our time allows just to mention all the awards, citations, accolades, honors and tributes that have gone to Elvis during his career. These are some of them. And as you can see, they come from all parts of the world, from all types of people and organizations, and they all represent some sort of milestone in a remarkable career. This is called the Hall of Gold, and the reason is obvious. It is the most impressive display of music awards ever assembled. According to most recent statistics, as of 1984, Elvis Presley is officially responsible for the sale of over one billion records, more than any other single artist or group in the history of the recording industry. What these platinum and gold albums and singles lining the walls of this room represent is a career that spanned nearly a quarter of a century. And the record awards cover not only rhythm and blues and popular music, but cross over into country, gospel, and rock and roll as well. He was the first performer to ever break down so many musical boundaries and succeed in such a variety of styles. Another interesting fact about his career is that Although many of these awards were for extraordinary sales in foreign countries, Elvis had never toured outside of North America, and his records were never translated into other languages. One time we were coming back from Hawaii, we just finished a show there, and we were on a commercial airlines, we were in the first class section, and the stewardess in the first class section told us there's a young group in the back called the Young Americans, they just did a show there too. So Elvis, being the way he was, decided to go back and talk to these young entertainers, and ended up, before you know it, they were all singing together back there, entertaining the people in the coach section. Well, it was a four and five hour flight, so we got to know each other pretty well. And this one young boy on the plane kept looking at Elvis's hand, and Elvis had this gorgeous diamond ring on. And this young boy said, one of these days I'm going to be able to afford a ring like that. Elvis said, you don't have to wait any longer. Reached over, pulled his ring off, and gave it to this young boy. The young kid was in his shock. I mean, it was amazing. It's thrilling to see those kind of things. About a week later, I get a phone call from the Beverly Hills Police Department. They've got a young boy telling a story that uh, Elvis gave him this beautiful diamond ring. He went to have it appraised at a jewelry store and they arrested him. And I said, no, Elvis gave him the ring and that's just the way Elvis was. Though Elvis was a very generous person, he never enjoyed his giving as much as when it went for charitable causes. Every year at Christmas time, he would show up with a large check to help in the work being done by 50 different local charities. One year, the grateful recipients designed this massive plaque as a way of thanking Elvis for never forgetting the needy and the less fortunate. Elvis was very proud of this, and it now has this honored place in the Hall of Gold. Most of us are very fortunate to have a shoebox full of souvenirs and remembrances for our careers. But Elvis was one of those rare people who, because of what he did and who he was, had enough reminders of his achievements to fill many rooms this size. These walls hold some of his prized possessions, and along with each item is a story. The stories, when woven together, form a tapestry of fame, fortune, success, challenge, perseverance, simplicity, and devotion. That is the basis of the legend known as Elvis Presley. Also on display in this room are the symbols of his remarkable career. 
the letters from presidents and heads of state, his costumes, his gun collection, jewelry, and badges. For a long period of his life, Elvis had uh, become a collector of police badges. Uh, it started here in Memphis when he became a deputy sheriff. Uh, sometime later, he became chief deputy, and my brother was elected sheriff uh, a year or so after that chief deputy badge. He called my brother one night and said, uh, Billy Ray, I'd like to come over and talk to you. I have some business to talk to you about. So my brother said, sure, come on over. Elvis got there and said, uh, you know, I've been chief deputy now for a year and a half. I've, I feel like I've done a good job, uh, and I want a promotion. And my brother said, well, I'm the elected sheriff. That's the only thing. That's, that's my job. And Elvis looked at him and said, uh, you wouldn't want me to run against you, would you? And so my brother laughed and handed him his badge, and uh, Elvis became the sheriff of Memphis. No less important are portraits done by fans, gifts, scripts from his phenomenally successful movie career, symbols of triumph and symbols of worlds left unconquered. Elvis was a showman in the best sense of the word. He always gave his audience more than simply music. Part of the overall effect of an Elvis Presley performance was due to the very theatrical costumes he had designed for each outing. Great care went into the design, choice of fabric and color, and the accessories that complemented each outfit. Bill Ballou was Elvis's designer, beginning with a 1968 comeback television special. Bill was told by the people who were putting the show together that they wanted a look that would capture some of the feel of the time when Elvis had first started out. That was the early 50s. The Rebel Without a Cause period of James Dean and the time of young Marlon Brando and the Wild Ones. That was the effect they wanted, but done in contemporary style. Elvis performed in this black leather look that Bill designed that became so identified with the show. For the 1973 Aloha from Hawaii special, the assignment from Elvis was to create something that said America. Outside of the flag, the first thing that came to Bill's mind was the American Eagle, and he designed the spectacular cape. The first cape was calf length, and it proved too cumbersome for actual performance. So another one was hastily made of the same color and design, only hip length, which made it much more practical. At the end of the television show, Elvis tossed the cape out to the audience, and no one knows for sure who now has the cape. But the one on display here was the original calf-length cape and jumpsuit designed for that historic occasion. The trunks were packed at the start of another tour, one that would have brought even more recognition and reinforced the love and devotion with which he was bound to his many fans. He was the king of rock and roll. But more than that, he was a very special human being who touched our lives, our consciousness, as few men have ever done. There's no doubt that we all miss Elvis. All the charm, the talent, the magic, the indefinable gift that made him such a, an important part of our lives. But we are very grateful for all the memories he's left us. Thank you for sharing some of them with me tonight. Don't be cruel, teddy bear, dancing hips and long black hair, old friend. You crossed my mind today. Las Vegas Hotel, Graceland, sweet young daughter and a million fans, old friend, you touched my heart today. If I listen to your calls in the still of the night, I can hear your voice saying you're alright. Close my eyes, open my soul, touch the key of my 